Trolloid Games. Join the fray. Here we are for GM's Tricks of the Trade. Something or the other. I think we're off kilter. We're doing a repeat. So this is a repeat. This is the seventh repeat. We're doing, we're revisiting so much. It's not a repeat. We're doing our, we're revisiting Tricks of the Trade from the, from a couple of years ago when we first started this, uh, this shindig. I didn't have time to put a column together this week. Uh, hammering out the last bits and pieces of the Starship Warden. That, that should be done uh, by tomorrow. All wrapped up. Uh, no later than Monday with the... I think the one thing we've got left is the poster coming in. So, with a little bit of luck, we'll be diving into the CKG. Uh, though it doesn't... It's mostly done. It doesn't need much left on the CKG, so... Uh. Good deal. Let me get this filed, Mr. Burns. I'm gonna do this right quick while we're waiting. Uh, let's do this and that and that and that and that. And there we go. All right. Easy peasy. So, yeah, today, like I said, we're doing a repeat from uh, earlier GMTTs. I assume that sound is good. I don't know that. Uh, my mic looks to be working. How's it going, Night5150? Can you hear me? I assume so. Uh, my little bars are bopping around over here. So I assume that's good. I hear you loud and clear. Excellent. So this week has been uh, interesting. I've been touching up the Goya, which is an, uh, really a, it's a supplement more than an adventure, but it's kind of an adventure supplement for the Starship Warden. Uh, so we can, that's the last kind of little bits, little bit piece to getting that thing shipped to backers. Uh, it just needed some tweaking. I needed, I, you know... Star Siege, uh, with which the Warden will be played, is a sub-game of Amazing Adventures. So I needed to get into Amazing Adventures and kind of teach myself the vehicle combat rules since I've got a spacecraft here. So I had all kinds of stuff to kind of do for the Goya, the last little bits and pieces. Uh, it's armor class, it's speed, and, and all of that business. Well, that's all done, so it'll be a fully functioning little star cruiser that you can take into whatever Star Siege game you have. And for those people who back to the Starship Warden, we will begin the the product dump tomorrow. Uh, it'll you'll get you'll get de definitely the manual for Star Siege. I think it actually includes Amazing Adventures, a PDF of Amazing Adventures as well. I'm not 100 percent certain on that. Um, and then Amazing Adventures Book of Powers. So you'll have a ton of stuff to actually play with the Starship Warden if you jumped into that. And of course, if you did not. And this stuff will start rolling out regularly. Um, the Star Siege stuff, it's... Uh, Star Siege is really part of our huge push into the Planescapes, alternate realities, uh, Venus, Earth in the future, Earth today, uh, and all of that goobly goop. So, Jason has kickstarted that with finishing that manuscript, which is very, very, very nice. Um, I'm getting no air in here. Uh, hold on, I'll be back in like one minute or so. I gotta, I gotta fix this. There she goes. All right. Hey, didn't didn't Jeopardy just get its new host? And didn't someone get that job? I think I saw that somewhere. I think I did. I'm not going to swear to it, but I think I did. Uh, 
How's it going, Commander? How's it going, King Kothar? Vic? We are here for GM's Tricks of the Trade. Blast from the Past number seven. I don't know. Archive edition. That's what Tim's calling it. The archive edition. That's much better than Blast from the Past. Logging in. There's no troll. Just a background. GM's Tricks of the Trade. Figured it. Figured out you're done. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's the self-help book. <laughs> the self-help books always kind of drive me crazy. You have to buy a book written by someone else to help yourself. It just seems... It seems strange, but I do know that <laughs> that some some people like the guidance and the direction uh, of of other people's living. Who's that uh, that young Japanese lady who does the what's it called? It she's clean she uh, clean your house, but declutters it or whatever that's called. Absolutely love that show. I love that entire concept. To be honest with you, <laughs> like it's just a good way to live. <laughs> New program, just a troll background. There you go. I was just watching Big Bang Theory and Sheldon was talking about going to Gary Con. It reminded me to turn off the TV and turn into Twitch. <laughs> there you go. Like the fireplace on a TV during Christmas. That's what it should be, man. But it would have to be, it would have to be like that. But just, wait, can I center that? Like that. Just a Dr. Pepper can. <sighs> They're filming a movie on my street. What are they filming? Uh, that would be a great first April GM would be Just leave it. Nothing else. <sighs> April Fools. Uh, I guess we just passed that, didn't we? Uh, product placement. I guess I could do some CNC product, but that's crazy. I think minimalism would be classified as unknown in my eyes. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, I don't know when. Uh, it's got to be seven, eight years now or so. But I really and Troller Games was the driving impetus behind this. Things had gotten so insanely chaotic here between the print shop, my office is the mail room. Things weren't getting done. There's paper everywhere. It's just mass chaos. Uh, and it was just, it was, it was slowing everything down because you have to spend X percentage of your time looking for an item or uh, filling it out or whatever when it should have already been done. Things get waylaid. Things get put on the back burner. They should have been, you don't finish it now and then two months later it becomes an actual problem. This type of thing that I began, this complete company overall from stop, top to bottom, uh, singling out an area in the company that was a problem, uh, going in, rearranging, fixing, getting rid of, doing whatever, uh, you know, whether it's just organizing the space or uh, facilitating a job, getting done faster, whatever it was. Well, that concept very soon spilled over into my personal life. <laughs> as I, I began as the more order evolved in, in my office, in my workspace, uh, and everyone else's workspace, uh, I wanted it in my own life. So if we've slowly, my wife and I have slowly, and she's now gotten a bug. It's taken a couple of years for her to get on board. But um, we've, uh, we've been moving in that direction. And those sections of the house that have been fixed, so to speak, um, it's just nice. It's just very nice. <laughs> Cats and dogs living here. Exactly. Steve, you're just going to cost me out. <laughs> exactly. It, it, I have to tell you, it, it is. It, it helps. It has helped with TLG immensely to get uh, this level of organization going on. Um, it's why I can open this giant drawer here and pull out almost anything. That's part of it. Cough syrup in the morning. There you go. Mass hysteria. Man, Ghostbusters. I was talking about that movie yesterday. Ghostbusters is a fantastic movie. I think that... As Dan Aykroyd goes, Ghostbusters, the first one, of course, and Gross Point Blank have to be my favorite Dan Aykroyd shows. I mean, I absolutely am a huge fan of Dan Aykroyd. He's funnier than crap on, on screen. Uh, but Ghostbusters and Gross Point Blank just did it for me. I think my problem is maybe books. Hard to get rid of the things I like to read. Yeah, I got, I got lots and lots of books. Lots and lots of books. And one of the things I don't like, Stephen, when I'm, I don't like my books stacked. I want them all in shelves. So that always causes a problem. I'm always having to find new bookshelves. Just bought my daughter a new bookshelf so she could do the same. It's, uh, it's just so much stuff. And books are so heavy. Though I hear you can get them digitally now. Oh, well, that's crazy. That's just madness. How's it going, Retro? But, <sighs> symmetrical book stacking. Yeah, there you go. I've seen some of those pictures where you make a Christmas tree out of books. Stuff like that. It's funnier than crap. Uh, but we are here for 
Man, I can't get his camera right. We are here for, I don't know what we're here for. Jim Strikes of the Trade, the number seven archive edition. We're going to plunge back into some of the GMTTs that we did in the early, a couple of years ago when we first started doing this column. Uh, and in those days, they weren't thematically based. They were just kind of a, a shotgun effect. And both Tim and Chuck are, are wanting to get a Twitch show on each one of these. So we're gonna we're not gonna we're not going to do a whole lot, you know, in a row. But we're gonna try to do maybe one a month where we're just playing catch up. I think it was it's either 25 or 19 or 30 somewhere around in there that we got to do to get caught up somewhere around. And I'm not really sure. I don't. I try not to count too much of this stuff. Dan Aykroyd has a superhuman ability where he can talk about anything and it sounds like it is the most important 100% real thing ever and you should absolutely be listening to him because he knows what he's talking about. Even if he's a real stinker, like nothing but trouble. <laughs> yeah, he's just, just delivery is brilliant. It's just brilliant. Uh, which is why I purchased hard copies of CNC. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I just don't do the whole... Uh, I think my problem may be I, I just don't do the whole digital stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm the same way, Steve. My wife loves them, but... Um, I, I've tried. I just can't get into it. Uh, well, that's cool. I assume then you have met him, Vic Danger. I absolutely love Dan Aykroyd. I mean, he really, going way back to the SNL days when he was, you know, doing the, the first, whatever, first season of SNL. He's just funnier than crap. Blues Brothers, all his, all his stuff is just good. And he actually can play a very wholesome, normal character as well uh, without going comedic. So Bill Murray's got that same, same kind of talent. But all of that aside, let's jump into GM Tricks of the Trade, uh, or we'll turn this into yet another movie edition, uh, which we still have not managed to get up and going. Uh, we, were, we were definitely going to do a, a, a troll talk on movies. Uh, one of these days we'll actually make that happen. <sighs> Dan Aykroyd believes in ghosts and aliens in real life, though. Hey, man. Hey. I can't say what he's seen and what he's experienced. I don't get to judge that, so <laughs> there you go. Omo's on board. Uh, you know, what, what, whatever factors play into, and I've had some, some strange events happen in my life that I've never been able to fully explain. Uh, part of me wants it to be a ghost. Part of me's like, that can't be. So who, who really knows? Uh, I think I take a, a pretty neutral ground on that whole, that whole discussion, though. I really, I really want to believe in Sam Squanch, uh, Bigfoot. Man, Bigfoot's the dude. Bigfoot's the guy. I watched a whole special on him just the other day. <laughs> are we going? Are we still going to see the Castle Keepers guy June, July time frame? Absolutely. Uh, I believe if I open this email, what I'm waiting for at this point um, is the printer to send us the quote. As soon as they send us the quote, uh, which I have a good idea of what it's going to be. It's really paperwork at this point. I'll sign it. Uh, let me see. She sent something to me today. I will sign it, get it back to her, which will probably be in the morning. Then they will open up a spot. They'll make a spot for it in their printing queue. Uh, I don't know where that damn thing went, but that is definitely the... Yeah, there she is. Yep. So that's the quote that I was looking for. Oh, it's a good price, too. Eh, good. Very good. Very good. I like it. Um, yeah, so I'll get that signed and over to them and off to the printer, and it, it's, we're past the yearbook season, so it should take them about three to four weeks to get that thing done, so I'm hoping to be shipping that thing fully in June. Uh, what we'll do is we'll wrap, wrap up uh, Warden to tomorrow, and probably by Tuesday, uh, as we're, we'll begin printing and binding and getting all that stuff done, we should be shipping Warden Monday or Tuesday. That's going to take us about five days. Uh, and then in the end term, I'll get Peter Bradley working on a last little tidbit for the CKG so that I hope to have everything done for the stretch awards for the CKG by the time the book arrives and we can begin shipping immediately. So I really anticipate the Castle Keeper's Guide, Warden, and the Monsters and Treasures of Air 5th, 5th Edition all to be done within the next month. Gone and shipped and off to you guys, which will be super, super happy. i seen a Sam Squanch. There you go. You and Rob Lowe, I think Sam Squanch lives in my head. Sam Squanch, that's some Trailer Park Boy stuff right there. Yeah, there's so many products. There's so many products. But we're catching up. And the Warden alone had 20, 20 items associated with the main book. Uh, so, And we've hammered all that out, uh, ready to go. The box looks... Oh, it was around here somewhere. The box looks... What the fuck is that? I'm going to go get that because I know we're doing GM Tricks. Thread be right back. I think you guys will appreciate this. So, 
that's the weight of it, if you can hear that. That's the Starship Warden. So here, I don't know if you can see that. Here is the box. Now, the box is actually not, it was not intended to hold the book. The box is intended to hold all those 20-odd stretch rewards that I told you about. But, it actually fits in there perfectly. Now, it won't fit with the stretch rewards. Uh, I just didn't want to strain the box too much. But out of that will come, of course, this monstrous tome. And then there's your box. Da -da 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 -da. I'm super jazzed about all of that. Uh, it's turned out beautifully. Jim called me the other day. He got his copy. He was super happy. Um, but that is the, that is the warden uh, and everything that goes with it. So, all right, there goes the box that goes with it. All right. Mac Muddles is in the house. Very cool. Uh, Mac Muddles, for those of you who don't know, is the co-creator of Castles and Crusades. Uh, let's see, this is some nice trade. Yeah, absolutely. Jason Walton did the cover. He did a beautiful cover of the boxes. We had a huge mix-up with the boxes for Memorial Tomb. Partially my fault. Partially uh, the, the uh, manufacturer's part fault. We worked all of that out. Got a great procedure lined out. So going forward, the boxes that we make will be even a little bit better. Uh, super jazzed on all of that. Uh, it's just, it's really good to work with people like that. <clears throat> really, really good. I just gave one of our copies of the PHP to the therapist friend who co commented, Killing a dragon, what could be more empowering? There you go. Absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Role-playing bank games are hugely empowering. We're watching an entire new generation of people discover role-playing games. Uh, it's, they have been doing so under our noses for about three to five years, and it's absolutely fantastic. It's very cool seeing it happen all over again. So loving the free PDF, uh, he can give copies to patients, absolutely. We're gonna actually do a push on that next week. Let's remind people that that's ab absolutely out there. You can use that warden book as part of a weight training program. <laughs> yeah, it's like six and a half pounds. <laughs> it's ridiculously heavy, but that's good. I suppose that's good. All right, so we're gonna plunge in. Wait, would you be willing to say who you use for a US printer asking for a friend? <laughs> I can shoot you a message. We use Walsworth for all our hardcover printings there out of Missouri. And we use Pack Lane. I believe Pack Lane has offices in California and Pennsylvania. And I believe we use the Pennsylvania folks uh, for the boxes. So I'll be happy to give anyone contact information for our printers. Love sending them business. Uh, love the whole, the whole community of it. I'm going to have to watch this later on VOD. Got to coach some, H, some high school softball. Very cool. Eat to surf. Have fun with that. Uh, you'll need one for each hand, though. <laughs> Doing that. It's way too much. It's way too much. It's ungainly. Maybe we could run a bar between two of the books, and you can lift the books like that. <laughs> All right. So the first trick of the trade in this archive edition number seven is playing big games. Now, some of you have seen me at Gary Con and some of the other conventions run tables up to 24. I think that's my biggest table. It might be 28. I honestly can't remember uh, and I do a fair job of keeping everyone engaged. Uh, Bill Webb, I know over at Frog God, he gets, he gets similarly sized tables. Um, but uh, so one, and I get frequently get, uh, get asked frequently how I keep everyone kind of engaged. And sometimes you lose people, but one of the things, for the most part, I try to keep everyone engaged. And one of the things that I do, uh, was it 27, that's where we're landing. Uh, I, I couldn't remember what it was. I knew it was a lot. I knew, I knew I'd gotten past 24 at one point. Uh, absolutely insane. Uh, uh, lots of fun. It, it's, it's an insane amount of fun. I got to tell you. Uh, it's exhausting, I think, for everybody, but, <laughs> but it's super fun doing that stuff. It's the game with 27. All right, so, so, so Derek, you're in that game. Oh, you're in that game. Uh, <laughs> that was a fun game. Got to get back to Gary Con and get that going again. We just can't quite replicate that through uh, Zoom or Twitch or whatever is going on out there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think lots of Dr. Pepper <laughs> jazzes me up on energy, uh, I, I suppose. But one of the things that I do do at tables like this, and you can actually carry this over to smaller tables as well, uh, is I try to always engage with people all the time. Now that doesn't, you can't really do that. You can't really have a conversation constantly with five or six or eight or 27 people. But uh, when I'm sitting there, when I'm at the top of that table and I see, say I've got 20 players and I see two or three of them uh, that are beginning to look at their phone or clearly bored looking out the door or whatever, anyone that kind of makes any kind of motion or gesture, which indicates to me 
that they're checking out of the table just a little bit. And anyone who's run a game for two to a hundred people, you know the signs. You've seen it. You've seen when they begin to kind of step back because they're a little bored or something's caught their eye or whatever. One of the things that I do uh, to, to, to rope them back into the game to get their attention is I'll point to them. Uh, I'll, I'll point and get their immediate attention by a physical gesture of pointing to them and then uh, I'll say, some, I'll be right with you. So this gesture, uh, this gesture and then the comment, I'll be right with you or whatever, you know, variance of that that you do immediately brings them back to the table because now they're thinking, oh, wait a minute, the GM, the GM's singling me out uh, for something. So clearly something's coming my way because I'm the X, whatever they are. And that gives you a minute or so, maybe two minutes, maybe three minutes, to wrap up what you're doing and then pivot around and do something with that player. And at that point, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be an attribute check. It can be an action. It can just be asking them if you, if you can remember what they're playing and whatnot. It can be asking them what, what they do next, just to somehow engage them in the action that is going on. Um, but that, that gesture, and uh, I'll be right with you, the, the, the gesture and the comment combined just knows, just brings that person back. And what's equally as important is it makes you, it, it's kind of like creating a mental post-it note that you need to do something with that player. You've probably skipped that player for a couple of rounds and you need to get back on it uh, and, and give them some something to do at the table. So it's kind of a, a, a mental post-it and it's, it's a, an awakening for them and just kind of something to jolt them back to the table. That's one of the ways I keep, I, I, I do that in order to just keep everybody somehow engaged. And of course, you're going to have to do a variance of that comment, you know, whatever it is. But anything to bring them to the table, it's really, it really becomes, it, it becomes critical. <laughs> just bring them back to the table. The big games are nice because they, the whole rule, don't split the party, doesn't apply. <laughs> it's mass chaos at those big games. No offense, but that sounds like a miserable nightmare world. Sitting in a room with 27 other sweaty nerd guys rolling dice and shouting over each other in raw chaos. Yeah, it's never really like that. Um, generally, you know, I don't. Uh, some of my earlier tricks of the trade discussed this, but I, I try to do things right to left. You know, I try to do things in kind of an orderly fashion at the table. So you can quickly, within a few minutes, you can kind of realize when it's coming. I'll jump line sometimes if someone has that I know they're going to be doing or trying to do. But for the most part, I would say not for the most part, for the complete part, everyone at the table, I've done this 10 times, I guess, I don't know, eight times, 10 times, whatever. Everyone at the table is super respectful of everybody. No one's shouting, no one's shouting each other down. I haven't experienced any of that. Some people play a little bit louder. Some people are a little bit more demonstrative. Uh, some people get more into their characters and do a little bit more role playing. There's that type of stuff. But I really haven't seen, I really haven't seen any chaos at the table. Everyone's just, I don't know, they're just um, happy to be gaming, I guess. I don't know, it's very weird. The big games are nice because the whole world, yeah, yeah, and that, now tries getting at me people at a table. <laughs> Made for eight. Yeah, that could be a problem. <laughs> it really isn't chaotic. Also, CNC players are classier than average player, plus lots of us girls play. That is true. It's usually about, it's not maybe half girls, half boys, but it's probably 30%. And this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a step out of just GM tricks of the trade and do a plug for Castles and Crusades. One of the reasons that it's not chaotic is the game Castles and Crusades itself. Uh, CNC, is an, as many of you know, is an extraordinarily streamlined, easy to play, especially in combat uh, game. There's not a lot of baggage that comes with it uh, unless you want there to be baggage with it. So you can run rounds extremely fast and I tend to run rounds fast anyways. Um, so you've got uh, the game system itself kind of plays into it. I don't know that I would try that many players with a more complicated game, like, say, 3rd edition. And uh, complicated is not the word, but you know what I mean. There's just more, the more the players can do with all of their abilities and skills and feats and uh, all that craziness. Uh, blah, 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 blah. All right, so what kind of adventure do you plan with that many? Is it a particular scenario? No, um, yeah, I don't really... <laughs> It's usually a get from point A to point B adventure, and there's something that happens in between. It's frequently a river crossing, on a boat, off a boat, you know, something like that. I think the one Omut was in, I think this is that one. Um, they're, they were all on a barge leaving the darkened fold, and they hit a, a branch, 
in the river and it upended part of the barge and the adventure can the adventure just exploded from at that point as everyone's trying to get off the barge and then orcs were attacking in the bushes and stuff like that um he does it without notes uh how he remembers everyone's character and everyone wants to be doing i have a clue how he does it I, i've got a pretty good short-term memory <laughs> long-term memory is for nothing you are very fortunate that I played in a game for way too long that had 14 players and it was the worst thing. <laughs> Granted, it was a CNC. CNC does tend to lend itself to that. Just need a, a book, uh, a new book titled Castles and Chaos with the players that are more the worst. There you go. I love being drowned in Greg Streamlight's play. <laughs> yes, at least two of those, isn't it, Oma? <laughs> you will get across that river one of these days. Yeah, crunchy systems have a different style of play. Pathfinder, I understand, is pretty crunchy. I've never played it. I'm sure it's a great game. One of my best friends plays it all the time. So, uh, and it's Mark Sandy, you know, our print guy. Uh, he, uh, he he loves it. So, uh, I'm sure it's a fantastic game. But it's a little bit more crunchy. So, it's going to be a little bit harder to run uh, run huge tables like that. And it helps to know your world intimately to have option A, B, and C. All that's true, actually. And, and that's a great point, Tim says there. Because I created Aired and I'm, I'm playing in Aired. There's so many things that I can do with this setting that I, it's kind of second nature at this point. I mean, me and, and, and the crew I play with, Mac and uh, Chris, Todd, Mark, Davis, uh, you know, Laura, Sarah, uh, all of these folks, we've been weaving in and out of, of air for uh, 40 years, I don't know, 25 years, whatever it is. So it, 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 that certainly, the setting certainly helps. Uh, I never had to cross the river with Steve. <laughs> I lived to the very end. There you go. Uh, you did. A, I think I did a swamp adventure with you, with 27 people. It would take you four hours to drown in the river for get crossing. Yeah, it gets it, it gets funny. It gets pretty. It gets. I don't know. It's funny. It's very entertaining. And I gotta say, um, how very cool everyone is. How everyone. How how very cool everyone is that's sitting in these giant tables. And I even had two movie producers in one of the in one of the games. Um, one of them was the guy who produced um, uh, the, the robot car movies, the Transformer movies. So, uh, and they're all really, everyone's so super cool about it. It's just, it's very, I don't know, it's very cool. Um, and CNC is just, it's just fast paced. It's all there is to it. It moves. Uh, you can slow it down if you want to, but you can dance if you want to, but you'll still be a friend of mine. Is that how that goes? I don't think that's how that goes. Uh, all right. <laughs> yes, I'm getting a little tipsy by the end, the end of the evening. Uh, let's <laughs> so let's do trick of the trade number two. Okay, so this is this is probably the thing I am the most guilty of. This is absolutely crazy. Having played this game since 1970, whatever six, seven, whatever the hell it is, um, and it's a game based on fantasy, magic, magical worlds, and dragons, and fae, and all of those other things. I forget to weave magic into my games all the time. So one of the things that that I, I stressed in this GM thread is try not to forget that. One of the really cool things, when you're watching a good science fiction show, like let's say Alien, or even Aliens or The Expanse or whatever, that are really technical sci-fi shows, right? That get into kind of the, the nitty and gritty of, of our near future. One of the things that makes them so... Um, enjoyable is you can step into that reality uh, and believe it you can you're there you're part of it you know because it's all everything kind of makes sense so if you take a fantasy setting and you extract magic from it and you don't do magic a lot like I, I frequently do then you you run into the course of um, losing that huge element that's part of it and I don't mean you have to go pure xanth on it and everything is magical and there's magic everywhere you know like a uh, like legend or a fairy tale or whatever it is, just some kind of manifestation of magic somewhere that's not whose point of origin is not the wizard or the cleric. You know, whether it's uh, a, a will o' the wisp leaving a pool of magic behind, or you know, whatever, whatever it is, uh, seeing into another plane, whatever it is that you do, and it doesn't have to be much, but it's something that can help kind of just rope people into it actually being a fantasy magical setting and remind them that it's not a technical jargon. Uh, it's not alien or aliens. Uh, it's, it's something other than. Uh, and like I said, it doesn't have to be 
high magic. I mean, if you, you look at Tolkien, clearly not high magic, but there's magic everywhere in Tolkien, right? From the magical ring that um, Frodo's carrying to the sword of, I can't remember any of these characters, the, the, sword, of, <laughs> the sword of Aragorn, uh, glam, dra- uh, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. There's lots of magic everywhere. Even in Saruman's voice, there's just magic. So weaving that into your game, I think, is just, it's something easy to forget and something you should try to you should try to keep keep intact. You can see K if you want to. You, you can leave your players behind because your friends don't see and see if they don't see and see. There are no players of mine. Nice, <laughs> very nice. That video is still one of my favorite videos. Obviously, I watch it on MTV or VH1 or whatever it was back in the '80s. Song is fantastic. I love it. It's so fun, and the video makes no sense whatsoever. It's just. It's just a crazy video, <laughs> so now you've made it even better. We need to uh, we need to get Thomas and Giuseppe to, to sing it for us. That would be fantastic. And if you don't dance, and then they're no friends of mine. That's just great. How's it going, Mr. Obadiah? We're wandering in and out of... Who sang that? Who sang um, Safety Dance? Shit, who sang that song? I can't remember. It makes as much sense as the band name. Yeah, well, who, who did that? Men Without Hats. Who's the other men band? It's men without work. Men, men with, I love men without hats. So who's the other one? Who's the Canadian band that does a, shit, the land down under. Men without work? Men without work. Men at work. Men without work. Unemployed people. <laughs> men at work, yeah. Absolutely love both of those bands I love. Obviously, men without hats only had one, I, th- I think. They only had the one hit that I know of. Uh, but men at work had a bunch of stuff, and I absolutely I love Men at Work. I absolutely love that song. Whenever I'm wanting any kind of pick-me-up, I put on The Land Down Under or whatever that song's called, their main hit, and watch the video for a few minutes. The guy walking through the sand dune, if you haven't watched it, watched it. The the guy walking through the sand dune with the koala bear attached to a leash. I don't know what the hell's going on, but I love it. I don't know what's going on, but I absolutely love it. Uh, I've, I've never seen an Australian not laughing or happy, so I'm sure it happens, but... But my experience with, Austra- with Australians is nothing but insanely positive. So that song about the same. Yes, the song. Yeah, what is it? Uh, what is the? They eat it in Australia. I don't know. I can't remember. What is the topic of the day? Well, apparently we're on the '80s band Men at Work. Vegemite. Yeah, the Vegemite sandwich. Yeah, there you go. Do you have to keep it in with the rules as written for similitude or just unexplained? Unexplained. Yeah, no, what I do, what I try to do when my tiny little brain can remember it, uh, I try to just weave something in my descriptive text. I don't even have it, ha- it, it doesn't even necessarily have to have anything to do with the game. And the other night, they were they were moving through part of the dark and fold, and they saw some will-o'-wisps, and I just, I described, I don't even know why I described it, I just described you know, pools of magic. Uh, probably because I was, <laughs> I was rereading this this GMTT, but it just kind of lined up. And it's, it has nothing to do with the game, it has nothing to do with what they were doing, or anything there's no rule for it there's no i just made something up and i rolled with it just something in in your descriptive text that ropes them in and just reminds them that um, this is a, a game of magic and there's magic about because uh, that's that's really the cool thing about fantasy right i mean um there's so many corollaries you know i was, I was working on this goya the ship the goya for the warden in the last few days um and when I was writing up the med lab, I, I, I described equipment that can heal, uh, you know, heal light, light wounds and heavy wounds and reattach limbs. And at the end of the day, this is, this is the same thing as restoration and cure light wounds and it cause light wounds, uh, you know, whatever. Not cause, cure critical wounds, whatever. The same concepts are there, but the mood is very, very different. The sci-fi, you want kind of a technical explanation why this is happening. The Expanse does that beautifully. Uh, and um, in the fantasy setting, you, you don't want a technical ex- explanation. You just need to understand that there's magic, so um, you, you, you roll with it. And that's you, you weave that into your descriptions more often than not, and it'll, it'll just help kind of remind everybody, especially you, the GM. It'll help you uh, remember that, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be running a magic game. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Uh, <clears throat> I see they are apparently well and truly into a few cases of beer when they film that. <laughs> I don't doubt it, Mr. Obadiah. I don't doubt it. It isn't entirely clear yet. I think running big games will be derailing. No need to listen to that again. Yeah, I love it. You, 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 you would listen to that once a day for the rest of your life, and you would be none the worse for wear. 
Now we can just work, uh, right, said Fred in the music video discussion. We really need to just do a pop culture discussion is what we really need to do. Never going to see that same topic. <laughs> the catwalk band who burned beds in the 80s. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Jennifer. And remember, kids, the spells in the PHP aren't all the spells in the world. And it isn't really the definitive way that magic works in the world. It's just how it works with the PCs. Just have stuff happen. Give monsters abilities that circumvent the rules. Magic is impossible. Go nuts. It will terrify your place. Absolutely. And that's a great piece of advice right there. Uh, unleash the dogs um, when it comes to magic, especially with your monsters. I am constantly. I did it the other night. I was running for the young young guys. I'm running at some kind of monster. And I didn't like it. I, 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 it wasn't going to be challenging. It's a cool monster. I liked the picture. I can't remember what the hell it was. I liked the picture, uh, but I read the abilities. I thought this isn't going to be very fun. And on the following page, I just happened to notice this other monster. I had this other ability, and I just grabbed it and dropped it on this monster. <laughs> it just made an amalgam. And you can do that with spell and spell like effects to the cows come home. I mean, there's no end to that. So, um, yeah, definitely a way to do that. Well, I'm here to chat. Uh, LOL, taking a break from Shift at the Tavern. And not a lot of folks here spending coin on a lot of money on being an entertainer at the Tavern this early in the night. Ah, so it's a good time to kick back and discuss whatever the living hell we're discussing over here. <laughs> Thank you for the subscription, Canadian ga Canadian Engine Gamer. Very much appreciated. The Midnight Oil. A Midnight Oil. Is that a band or the song? All right, wait a minute. Davis is texting me. Okay, no, he's just sending files left and right. Good deal. Uh, see, chat does such a good job of going off on <laughs> tangents. must be difficult to post this stuff. We certainly go off on tangents. I think I might be as guilty as everybody else. <laughs> you know, it's funny, though, because we've all gamed so much. And you know, for, even for those of us who haven't gamed a lot, we've got this whole just giant bag of experiences and tales and things that trigger, and especially those of us who lived... Through the 80s, I think, uh, I think that there was kind of a slump in the 90s in RPGing. I think, you know, until 3rd edition came out, it, was, it wasn't dead, it hadn't ended, we were all still gaming, but there wasn't this huge explosion of new players. So the 80s was this time of, of us living, the, living, living large on, what, on all the AD&D and the 2nd edition stuff that was coming out, and uh, no OGL, so there was no, you know, other versions. Um, and we've all got this these experiences that line up both with our games and our MTV is new, VH1 is new. There's so many things happening in the pop culture. What we went from Betamax to VHS. Um, you just you suddenly you go. You don't have to go to the movies to watch the theater to watch it. You know, the theater to watch a movie. You can watch it at home. Uh, and I remember the Betamax because I had a Betamax long after VHSs had completely squashed the market and there were no Betamaxes left. Um, and so. Uh, so I think that there's this there's this interesting, especially for people, Gen Xers, I suppose, there's this interesting amalgam of the pop culture and the massive technological changes of the 80s uh, and really the sociological changes of the 80s because we were living a little bit differently, uh, theaters being the most uh, obvious example of that, with Dungeons & Dragons and our role-playing games because we were playing it like crazy uh, and we were watching VH1 and Beavis and Butthead and whatever the hell else we were doing. Uh, there you go. Tricks of the trade, large gaming groups, and eighties music videos. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how we got. I don't know how we got there. <laughs> Something. No, it was that, that damn safety dance because I triggered myself. <laughs> okay, I have to cook dinner. <laughs> all right, Jennifer. Yeah, tabletop Santa. We all want to game more. Uh, just good stuff. Laser discs. There you go. Well, not even just that. If you have an NPC wizard, give them some. Made up magic power, some spell that nobody knows, some ability the players can't access. Oh, this wizard has a curse that can turn your skin inside out. What spell is that? Don't worry about it. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Just run with it. Absolutely run with it. And then if you're, and if you're good later, you can write that stuff up and make it a permanent part of the game. But you don't even have to do that. Just bringing magic to the table is a great way. It's just a great way to remind people that it's a fantasy game. And get their minds kind of in that, in that mindset. Ren and Stimpy. Good God. Man, when I was in the Army, I didn't have a TV, but in barracks, when Ren and Stimpy would come on, it would start at one end of the barracks and go all the way down. People shouting, Ren and Stimpy, Ren and Stimpy, and people running for their TVs to watch Ren and Stimpy. That, <laughs> that I definitely remember. That <laughs> was funnier than crap. All right, Geo's trick of the trade number three. Okay, so this one's just, this one, 
uh, pops up a little bit, I think, occasionally. I saw actually someone talking about it on TikTok the other day. It was very cool. Um, but mixing it up. Just mix the crap up. Mix up your flow. Uh, and I'm a perfect example of that. For quite a while, I was... I got into this routine of we start the game at X hour, we play for a role play a little bit, get the game going, an overland adventure, maybe a small encounter. By the end of the evening, we had a large encounter close. Next week, same thing. Next week, same thing. And after, you know, quite a few games of this, I was bored into a stupor with what was going on. And, and I could see it was, you know, seeping into my players, too. They were bored, bored with everything. Was, it, was, it had gotten very predictable. So just shake up what you're doing. Shake up your order of events. You don't even have to have a major encounter in an evening. Don't worry about that. Have the major encounter when it actually happens. Uh, and if you feel yourself getting into any kind of rut or a routine, shake it up. Because your characters, your players are going to get into that same routine and they're going to start anticipating it. And in the slow periods, you're going to lose them. Uh, and they'll come back on for the fast period, stuff like that. So shake up the routine as much as you can. I like bonds in my game, like Bond of Heredity. I have a character who has a weapon that is a family heirloom that is only activated by members of that family. Very cool. I believe there is a class in the Adventurer's Backpack in CNC that does that. I can't remember what it is. Is that the Oathsworn? Something. There's something that actually creates... Uh, there's a You take an heirloom and it actually has magical powers. That's very cool. Great minds, tabletop, great minds. If you cross the river, then you encounter the giant. You will not survive the giant. Hey, you got to get across the river first. That's the <laughs> that's the key to that whole thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just shake up shake up your evenings uh, you, uh, play a little bit. Just make sure it's a little different and keep things hopping. And what I've done in the last year or so, two years, it started before COVID. But what I've done is I try to not adjust my story for anything. So as the other than the play of the characters, the reactions of the characters as we're going forward, I just keep spinning the yarn. And it might be two games before there's a big action. Uh, I'll shake it up only if I see people are getting bored. But frequently there's enough role-playing, problem-solving, uh, interactions between the, the players themselves uh, to propel all that stuff forward. And, of course, I'm with a, a heavily, with my Thursday night game, heavily, heavily veteran crew uh, who, don't, who aren't thirsty for combat all the time. I mean, they'll, they'll, obviously they love it, but you know what I mean. They, if it doesn't have a combat, they don't. Think, well, I know experience tonight or whatever the heck. So, uh, uh, yeah, just shake up, shake up your round a little bit. If you cross the giant and you encounter the river, he will not survive the river. <laughs> what if you encounter the giant in the river? Or giant river, as Blood <laughs> Wild says. Yeah, I couldn't imagine swimming in the Mississippi. But we may have to soon the bridge, one of the two bridges from... Uh, Eastern Arkansas, over there in West Memphis to Memphis, uh, it, it broke. It just broke. Uh, we broke our bridge. <laughs> Damn it. Who broke the bridge? Another is Bond of Proximity, where two characters have trained so much together that when they are within five feet of each other, they get advantage in combat ten feet away and no bonus, fifteen feet apart. And that is a fantastic idea, tabletop. That is, that is a badass idea. I love that. That's really cool because that actually uh, they... That, it, that gives your players this incentive to actually work together, play together, and gives them role-playing opportunities and, you know, combat opportunities. That's just a fantastic... That is just absolutely... That's, that is just a great idea. I cannot express how cool that idea is. <laughs> right. uh, let's see. Yeah, I broke it. It fell down. <laughs> fell down. <laughs> I, got a, I finally got a picture of the, the, the crack in the beam. It just... This is cracked. <laughs> Someone get the welder out, I guess. Can't remember how many cars go over that thing a day. It's ridiculous. Memphis is a pretty big city, and it's a hub. We get uh, it's a hub for trucking companies, like six, five. I don't know, a huge number of trucking companies. So constant freight coming up from Dallas and. Uh, whatever, rolling through through Little Rock and into Memphis. Uh, and someone just broke the bridge. Apparently, tabletop did. <laughs> there you go. With a giant crack in his in the river. That's possible. You never know. The Mississippi is an old river, and it's filled with all kinds of stuff. God only knows. Uh, I was watching one of those uh, shows where you, the cops or whatever, and someone had shot some other poor fella, and the gun is gone. And the cop was like, they showed him standing next to the Mississippi. He's in Memphis, and he's standing next to the bridge at the Mississippi River, and he said... There's no telling how many guns and cars and other things are in that river. <laughs> 200 years of, of, of chaos in Memphis, I can only imagine. 
<clears throat> reminds me of a teamwork feature in Pathfinder. Yep, that is cool. That is a that is a great idea, tabletop. Yep, yep, yep. I may steal that. It, yeah, tabletop. You won the you won the stream tonight. Everybody loves that idea. That is a, a giant. That is just a fan. It's a really cool idea. I really like it. It was a giant catfish. It just jumped out of the surf. Smacked. Do rivers have surf? I don't think rivers have surf. Uh, it ju it jumped out of the stream. I don't know. The water hit the bridge. Uh, cracked it. And now we've got traffic. I don't even know. I think they've rerouted that mess. I haven't been to Memphis in a while. Since conventions have shut down, we don't go to Gen Con, we don't go to Origins, there's no reason for me to go over the river that much. I used to go over the river all the time. I used to go to Memphis all the time. Let's see, so trick of trade number four. <clears throat> Dr. Pepper Zero tastes like diet, Dr. Pepper. I've not had either of them, so yeah, rivers have no buck. <laughs> not going down that road, <laughs> game goes hard. <laughs> I need to get a hold of Sarah and have her write me an essay on that. <laughs> Let her figure that out. Well, I'm over 400 pounds and forgot to tie my shoes and fell down. <laughs> there was a seismic event and the bridge just couldn't handle the punishment. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, that, we, we got one left, I think. They're going to have to do something. I mean, they, <laughs> they can't not have that I-40 bridge. That's just... I got to do something. Maybe get the Army Corps of Engineers to throw up a pontoon bridge. Something like that. So trick of the trade number four. So this was a really simple one. Uh, something that uh, I don't really do that often myself uh, unless I have something complicated planned. Now, if I have complicated, I'll do this, but if I'm just kind of running, like right now, uh, we in, in my Thursday night game, we've kind of set the, the big quest aside, and they're just doing a walkabout. They're just um, they're just moving through the dark and fold. And kind of re they haven't been there in like two years, so they're reacquainting themselves with the dark and fold. So I don't really need, need this, but... If I've got something complicated planned, like in the big campaign arc that they're on, I write up an outline. I just kind of give an, just bullet points of things that are in my mind that are happening or I want to happen or will be a reaction to actions that they take. And it's never, it's never like one of those outlines you wrote for your English teacher. It's just brief little sentences, half sentences, and notes kind of staggered out in, 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 in order, you know, in a, a chronological order. And I always do it on the computer because, because as you all know, as the way your players react uh, to this, that, or the other, they go this way, they go left, they go right, they go center, uh, and they mess up your timeline. They, they're going to mess up the reactionary timeline. They went to see the giant when they should have seen the, the druid, and now you got to do this the move the druids could do in this while the giant was reacting to this or whatever the hell's going on. Uh, so I do it on the computer so I can cut and paste and move stuff around, move thoughts around that may, this doesn't happen now, it happens here or what have you. Uh, so, so working up some kind of outline on complicated uh, large campaigns is just, it's just a good idea. Uh, you have one left for now, but I do not have my eyes on it. <laughs> don't, don't kill our other bridge! <clears throat> good Lord, if that bridge went out, you'd have to... St. Louis has a bridge. There's a bridge south of St. Louis. There's a bridge down in southern Arkansas, Vicksburg. There's a bridge at Vicksburg. You'd have to go all the way down to Vicksburg to get across the river. That seems extraordinary. Uh, when is the next TLG fan Twitch game? It's been about a month or two, uh, right? Getting antsy because I have a great idea for a dancing light spell. <laughs> Coming soon, actually. We've got three games, I think, two, may, definitely two, maybe three, that I'm running for the Player's Handbook Kickstarter. We're going to get on that very soon. As soon as the Warden's off my desk, which will be in the next few hours, um, and the CKG is well under control, which should be by next week, I think we have one little book left to do for the CKG, the Book of Tables. I gotta double check that, but other than that, that Kickstarter's finished. Um, and then we're gonna jump right on top of the player's handbook and at the top of that list, not at the top of that list, but in the top of the list, uh, are the games, because we gotta run three of them and we want, kinda wanna space those out. So that's that's coming pretty soon. They went to see the giant when they should have crossed the river. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you, will you be at Gen Con in September? I will not. Uh, we have not been to Gen Con since 2017. The, the nature of the show changed enough uh, that I felt uh, it just wasn't a good venue for us. Uh, I love Gen Con. We've been going since the year 2000. We, you know, 18 Gen Cons in a row. It's just a great show. Uh, but it, it changed more. Their focus shifted more from RPGs uh, like Castles and Crusades or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. And, and their focus is on larger game companies, board games, but also just larger companies, which has changed the nature of the clientele and the people that are going there. Uh, so we, we, we stepped back from that and started adding smaller cons to the roster. Of course, 
We do that for a couple of years, and then the COVID mess comes rolling along, and knocks all that off. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what. I haven't made any definitive decisions other than this year in the year 2021. We will not be at Origins, and we will not be at Gen Con. Uh, in my head is to reassess Gen Con for 2022, and maybe Origins for 2021. But on the on the other side of that is this new platform that I want to explore uh, to allow all of us to kind of interact more. And then also uh, hitting smaller cons, more smaller cons, like a Gary Con and a Game Hole Con and whatever the heck it is. And we really have not hit the Southwest, Southeast, I mean, very much with conventions. And I know there's some very large ones down there. So there's just so many options on the table. And we really, at this point, we're in a holding pattern to see how states and companies and venues are going to react to the rollout of the vaccine and all that goobly, 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 goobly. Uh, so everything's in the hole. We did find for TrollCon, we found a small castle in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Which would be cool, but it's pretty far away from everybody. <laughs> so it'll be a lot of driving. Uh, so no origins either. Gen Con is too big. They have abandoned the indies. Yeah, it's just the nature of the, the show has changed. Yeah, I thought they had like 60. Didn't they have 60 or 70,000 attendees last time I was there in 2017? Man, I missed that show. That's a fun show. Eh. Uh, still waiting to see you at the European con that we need to do. I, I will probably be going to England. My daughter is headed off to York next year to study uh, uh, medieval history for a year. So I will probably be in England sometime next year to, to visit her. Just looking at when I will get to hang with you and crew. Dragon Con, still to this day, my favorite convention of all time. Uh, I went to Dragon Con for 10 years running from 1991. I missed a couple when I was in the Army, but 1991 to, the, to 2000. Until we opened Troll Lord Games when we shifted our focus to Gen Con. If you have not been to Dragon Con, go to Dragon Con. It is a fantastic convention. It was. Last time I went, it's multi-genre. So you've got comic books and Star Wars and Star Trek and role-playing and horror stuff and fantasy writing and science fiction writing and just everything that you can possibly think of is at Dragon Con. An insane amount of fun there. I've had strange run-ins with actors. I ended up at a bar one night with Walter Koenig. It was just bizarre. <laughs> Strange. Uh, I don't know. It's just all kinds of oddities. I uh, watched Darth Vader hit on a woman one day. It was really cool. Met Boris. I uh, Just all kinds of just strange and weird things happen at Dragon Con. And plus, the first convention I went to, the first Dragon Con convention I went to, there was a group there called the Torture Garden, and they were doing Shakespeare's Macbeth in s and m gear they did a, an s and m version of shakespeare well i mean i'm watching that i'm not there's no way you can't watch that and and i went to the torture gardens show every year after that i went to, to dragon con because <laughs> it was some crazy shit but it was just cool so dragon con is the convention if i if i can get to a convention mac models remember <laughs> mac remembers he went to a lot of dragon cons with me uh dragon con is just pure awesome I went to Gen Con back in 2016 when attendance was at an all-time high. It was a living... Yeah, it was like 70,000, I think, in, in 16, 17. I think that's where they got to. A period insurance for any cons is not being issued while the provincial government is in lockdown. Yeah, that's... I, we're still having some mixed messages coming from states down here, too. So, till that's cleared up, who knows? Uh, Gen Con will be on TikTok next week. Oh, interesting. And someone will... Someone you know will be running the account. Hey! Very good. Very cool. I've never been to a con. I always wanted to. Closest to me is Kubla Con. So Kubla Con, that's in San Francisco, right? The, the Bay Area. I've been. I went to about four Kubla Cons back in the early aughts. Uh, I did four in a row. Really good little show. About fifteen hundred attendees. Really, really good show. Um, I see. Call of a character show to the con scenes. Oh yeah, absolutely. And Dragon Con is the best of them all. 70,000 attendees at Gen Con and brought over 100,000 people into the city. Yeah, yeah, Gen Con is huge. Yeah, but it's not even the size that bothered me so much as the, the nature of the venue inside, which meant with bigger companies, and I mean, these are big companies like Asmodee and whatnot, and they're consuming the entire floor space or huge swaths of the floor space, pushing smaller companies to the side and left. And the, the consumers that are coming in, that's where they're going because that's where the main collectibles are and that's where the main release, the new releases are. So it's not so much people going into the dealer's hall as it was, say, back in 2010 where they're just kind of wandering around and shopping and you could be constantly pulling people out of the aisle to pitch your game, Castles and Crusades, whatever it is. 
it's changed now to a very corporate approach, which is okay. I don't have any problems with corporations or all that bullshit, but uh, for Troll War Games, it meant that we watched this this ever-reducing, not attendance for us. I mean, we're still probably hitting people, but we definitely weren't. We actually saw uh, less traffic. The more people went to Gen Con, we were seeing less, less traffic at the booth, uh, and that's always an issue. So it is San Francisco. Yeah, Blood Wild, you should go. Uh, Aldo Giazzi, a very close friend of mine, goes every year at Kubla Just a, it's just a great little show. It's another. There's another one out there too that I've been to. I went to Kubla Khan and something else. I can't remember. Uh, it's less than half the size of San Diego and New York, which I love going to uh, those as well. But I'm not. But I'm that odd bird that loves huge crowds. Uh, decreased engagement. Uh, yeah, I, it's. I don't mind the crowds. I really don't. Um, it's kind of. I like. I'm a huge people watcher, so it's kind of. Cool to watch all that unfold around you, um, but from a from TLG's perspective, obviously we have to consider, you know, what we're doing there, why we're there, the advertising possibilities, the market exposure, you know, costs and all of that googly goo. Uh, and for Gen Con, it becomes in order to make it worthwhile, you have to put in a month's worth of work beforehand, two three work, weeks worth beforehand. You got a week wind down as you come back and fix all the problems that erupted that you couldn't take care of in those three weeks. So you end up losing a month's worth of time. Uh, and when you throw in all the holidays that we have here in the United States and all the other crap that you have to do, you end up losing four months of work a year not working. Uh, I, I like working for those who haven't been around the stream for a while. I feel like there will be a shift to more RPGs at cons, PAX Unplugged, but only because of how much bigger RPGs have gotten due to the pandemic. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, it'll be very interesting because that's really up to the convention owners which direction they want to go. Uh, the big sponsors uh, can pay, like a Gen Con, uh, I think the sponsors pay up $25,000 or something like that. So you want bigger companies in there that can pay that sponsorship bill because that helps cover your bottom line. Uh, and the smaller companies just can't, There's no, and there's no reason for them to. And then you get into this bag of, if you're a sponsor, you get so much more stuff. So then the smaller companies even get kind of shunted to the side and even more. And it becomes this whole thing. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully. Now, the packs, we've looked at the packs quite a bit to see if we should be going to those. Uh, they're, they're, on the, they're on the target. Uh, we'll see. You can clean up way better at a lower mid-sized gaming convention. Well, you get a far better, you get a, uh, you get a better chance to, I hate the way this is, sounds, exposing yourself to new players does it sound right <laughs> exposing your game to new players uh, and that's what you used to get that at gen con because the traffic the foot traffic was so heavy on every aisle but i remember the last two or three shows that i went to the foot traffic was not heavy attendance is through the roof uh, foot traffic was down and the foot traffic was down because they're going somewhere else and that is the big companies for the collectibles and all that googly goo uh, it's weirdly political, not in a, a politics politics way, but in an interpersonal relations political way. Uh, need a new con. Uh, Pack South isn't too far. Yeah, that you're right. Pack South. We've also looked at the one up in there's one in Pennsylvania, I think. Um, but um, yeah, I, we we've definitely looked at the packs, uh, and we'll see. We'll see. We're gonna wait. Let this year run out, just to see what everybody's what everybody's gonna do. Um, Gary Con desperately needs two shows at this point, spring and autumn show. They had one planned, Derek. Um, they had it planned for October, but I think the Origins or Gen Con landed right on top of them. And there's no way you can compete. Pax Unplugged has had a big RPG interest. WizKids one year even redid their booth overnight due to the D&D demand. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, that's, very, that's good to hear. And I've heard good things about Pax, because it, it's like Dragon Con in that regard. It's a mixed gaming convention. Now, Dragon Con goes all the way to the end with its mixed you know, genres, but uh, I've heard, I've heard good things about that. Uh, it, I think King Kodo, it used to be more tech, but it's, that's, it's shifted away from that. Uh, it seems like people are thinking about cons lately. The Tuesday stream, we talked about troll con options. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I, I think everyone's kind of getting back to where they're comfortable stepping outdoors or doing whatever it is, uh, we do as monkeys and, um, the conventions for gamers is a huge part of it, right? PAX is a ton of board gaming, RPGs, card games, as well as computer gaming. PAX South has a good mix of tech. PAX Prime West is primarily tech. Yeah, PAX Unplugged is... Is that the one in Pennsylvania? I can't remember. Holy crap, we got one more We got one more GMTT today. So this one's really easy. Uh, I'll tie this into our convention because we it's it's 5 o'clock. We're supposed to be wrapping out. ReaperCon's a great con. Uh, we've sponsored them for years. I need to get back into that. Uh, I've just fallen off the convention thingamabob. 
So the last trick of the trade was look for adventure everywhere. This is obviously something we all do, and if you're not doing it, you should. You can find adventures in comic books, books, driving down the street, looking at stuff. Uh, I, I think that I frequently just stop, and I'm in the middle of a game if I need to do a shift, stop somewhere, go look at something for just two or three minutes, and pictures, visuals, Pinterest. There's so many just nuggets of inspiration everywhere that can fuel your adventure that uh, just get it everywhere. Just look for it everywhere. Online, on Twitch streams, on TV shows, whatever it is. Just pay attention while you're looking at stuff. Just think about, oh, how would this play into an, an adventure for some characters? This would be very cool. Uh, the more obscure thing you lift your inspiration from, the more brilliant the players will assume you are. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so it's just it's just everywhere. And, and that's a good point. I mean, you don't you don't want to make it super obvious there's an alien crawling, there's a predator that's hidden in the bushes that's going to track you down. You know, that's, that's clearly you can do that. You can take it and run with it. But uh, uh, there's so many other, so many other things, just, just information all over the place. So plunder that as you can. Uh, but yeah, this is, it is, it's a little past five and I got to wind out uh, a little bit more to do today that I got to, got to knock down. So we're going to cut this, but I will be back next Tuesday for uh, Ask Me Anything. By next week, things should be easing up around here now that the Warden is kind of... Those gajillion pieces are put together, and we're, we're ready for that. Box is in. That's good. All good news all the way around. Um, Davis sent in the last of the NPC Almanac has landed on my desk. So all, all good news all the way around, and we'll begin wrapping these things up now. Uh, and uh, so we'll see you next week at 4 o'clock for Ask Me Anything. And again, for Jim Strick the Trade, and we'll have a new fresh one next week and not one from the archives. So you guys all have a wonderful rest of your evening um, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Take it easy. Thanks, all. Thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, how do I do this? I got to stop streaming. All right, there we go. Take it easy, all.